Week five, that is a wrap. These are our instant reactions to everything that happened on Sunday, bye weeks included, big performances included, and some absolute no-shows. We can't wait to dive into the details to talk you through the games you did and did not watch and ones you absolutely should not. Daigle from 4 for 4, your overarching thoughts once again from this weekend of action. Competitive games this week, eh. I would say. We've, well, we've dealt with a lot of blowouts <laughs> through four weeks. Uh, I think the pretenders are showing who they really are. Oh, yeah. Now that we're five games through the season, we're going to talk about a lot of trending usage as well. So we'll, we'll get into it. Okay, let's dive into it right now and kick it off with arguably the best wide receiver in the league returning to action. Eagles versus Rams. Talk about competitive. The Rams, 14 points in the first half, Eagles, 17 points. But in the end, the Eagles improved to 5-0, and winning this one 23-14. A.J. Brown and Dallas Goddard both go over 100 yards on the opposite end. Daigle, Cooper Cup, 12 targets, 8 receptions, 118 yards. And we still get some Puka Nakua love in there, too. And everyone was curious if Puka could survive Cooper Cup returning. And it turns out it's just fine. Cooper Cup on the day, a 35% target share. Puka at 32.3%. The targets now filter strictly them as Van Jefferson was literally just removed from the offense altogether. We always question rational coaching. And in this case, Sean McVay kept everyone tried and true. Puka, Cup, and Tutu all over a 90% route participation. Tyler Higby in there as an every down tight end. Even Kyron Williams, 77% route participation. Everyone else below 15%. No one else in this offense matters as that's their three wide sets. That's their one tight end. And that's their one running back. Cooper's back. Like this dude is so back just to be out there explosive and for every single snap. What happened, I think at the end of the game, really, if you want to know like how did the Eagles swing this, one, their pass rush did catch up. I, I do question Stafford, who did limp off at the end, but trainers didn't even gather around him. It seemed like he was pushing them off from the sideline. Like, don't talk to me as Stafford, as we know, the first seven years of his career, basically, just played through injuries. That's who he is, and that's okay. He's an Iron Man out there. But the Rams' offense didn't pass into their side of the field, into uh, past the 50-yard line in the second half at all. Like, Ooh. they just weren't compatible in the second mm. half. And I do wonder if it's because maybe like Cup had been out there as a full-time player shaking off the rust. I wonder if Stafford, because he got banged up last week at two, shaking off the rust. Like maybe that's what we see what happens when veterans have to compete well into what was potentially going to become overtime. Meanwhile, Josh, on the other side of the ball, the Eagles, although they had struggled to this point in the season on third down, 13 of 18 on third down today. Yep. They just carved it apart. So ultimately, that's what it came down to. You also mentioned Dallas Goddard's big day. It's something we had crossed our fingers for because nowadays the way tight ends are used, everyone likes to cite their usage. And outside of like Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, and Sam Laporta, you don't matter. Like even T.J. Hawkins is running these dinky little two-yard routes. Good. Get your eight catches and get out of there because you don't matter unless you catch two touchdowns. He had totaled 88 yards receiving going into this game. Clearly over 100 dominated this one altogether. So that's how the Eagles basically got there in the end. Josh, I always talk about this with the 49ers, but this pass game offense, yeah. one of the one, maybe two of these guys are going to fail. One of them is going to go crazy. Today, yeah. it was Devontae Smith. He gets uh, basically only one catch here, and then Dallas Goddard's the one that really pops off. And then to, to me, Dale, Jalen Hurts, the first couple of weeks of the season, was missing some throws, taking a couple more sacks than he was, not scrambling as much just based off the box where it seemed like he at least was moving out there a lot more than usual with 15 carries. Have you noticed anything from Jalen Hurts that we should be more back to normal versus in the first kind of slowish start for Jalen Hurts? A season high in design runs today, actually. Nice. Uh, that's what they were avoiding the first month of the season. Whether that continues or not, I don't know, because the game plan clearly today was to practically avoid running back usage as both DeAndre Swift and Kenneth Gainwell just don't get there in the end. Uh, AJ Brown also just dominating in man coverage, some beautiful throws dropping into a bucket from Hertz as well. It seemed to be more of the game plan today than what it may or may not be moving forward. Just something to monitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will say for Swift, I mean, 17 carries for 70 yards, then yeah. six receptions for 38 yards. I, I would argue maybe that six receptions might be a season or a game high over the last two seasons for this team. And I think there were times when they were motioning him out and using him as like a legit 
wide receiver. Mm-hmm. I, I did want to go back to the Matthew Stafford side of this because the first half, man, he was on freaking fire. That yeah. dot to Tutu Atwell on the first drive, which is only like a five yard completion or a six yard completion, but it, you know, lifted over the linebackers and a defensive back and perfect placement. The Puka Nakua touchdown catch for 22 yards was an absolute dot that I think only had like a 27 percent percent rate that it could have been completed based on next gen stats. And then, yeah, Daigle, what you said at the top about Cooper Cup, how in the opening drive he gets six freaking targets. I thought we were on pace for like a 20 target game for Cooper Cup, and it was just yeah. option route after option route. And I really want to dig back into it into the second half and try to understand why that didn't continue for all four quarters. That's a ridiculous pace, of course. And I think it really might come down to, based on what you're saying, the Philadelphia Eagles pass rush just definitely showing up with the likes of Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter and Hassan Reddick in the second half. And that's just what happens when you have a unit that you've invested that much capital into. We lost Christian Gonzalez in defensive rookie of the year betting, but here is Jalen Carter. He has yeah. three and a half sacks through five games. And the only, only other Eagles in history to do that in their first five games over three sacks is Reggie White and Corey Simon. He's joining like the ranks of the greatest. So he's getting it done every single week. Hayden, question for you. Eagles are 5-0 and right now. These are their next games. Jets, Dolphins, Commanders, then Cowboys, Chiefs, Bills, and 49ers. Let's so go. Obviously, the Dolphins is a tough matchup coming up. But, man, once we get into that late October mm-hmm. uh, to all of November and early December, this is an unreal stretch of games that we're going to get from the Philadelphia Eagles on a weekly basis that we will all be trying to draft in front of each other. Yeah, this is going to be great television, but also like last year, the fourth quarters where they weren't participating in the offense, all right. those games sound like we're going to have some fourth quarter production. So that's how Hurts, A.J. Brown could really start to pop off. Kyron Williams, extremely inefficient today. Yes, and has been extremely inefficient on the season, but 15 of 16 running back touches. Everyone's trying to be ahead of benching or getting rid of Kyron Williams in their lineups. You just keep riding it until someone else proves they're worth the opportunity. Everyone's yeah. trying to chase Zach Evans, who isn't even active for these games. Even the Rams don't care about Zach Evans. Ronnie Rivers, again, only had his nine touches last week because it was while Kyron Williams was taking breathers on the sideline. Again, Rivers, one touch today. It does not matter if he's inefficient or not. At his next two games, even next week against the Cardinals, that's how you explode is by handling over 90% of the team's touches. So on one hand, yes. Back-to-back games with a single-digit target share. On the other hand, he's out there every snap, and that's all I care about in this injury real running back season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Hayden, I do want to dive into Dallas Goddard when we get to Stats versus Film this week. And I think maybe a part of it, again, just hypothesizing here, is who the Rams have at their linebacker grouping and at their safety grouping in comparison to Dallas Goddard. But I just again, want to see where he ran his routes and where he got all those targets because we go from basically nothing through this entire first four weeks of the season to over 100 yards in week five. Raheem Morris, respect where it's due. It's going over to the uh, Miami Dolphins and, uh, you know, teach the league how to play some offense. Giants versus Dolphins. Dolphins improve to four and one being the New York Giants. 31 to 16. A two touchdown, two interception performance from Tua Tungavailoa. But man, Hayden, the speed is so real. I'll pull up all these charts. but We get it from the fast guys. Devon A-Chain, 11 carries for 151 yards and a score. Raheem Moser pops up for 65 yards and a score. And Tyreek Hill, his standard nine targets, eight receptions, 181 yards, and another tutty. This was, to me, all skill players. It wasn't necessarily Tua. It wasn't necessarily the scheme. Obviously, the scheme's helping to some degree. But Tyreek Hill, it was a cover one look, which we were expecting against Wink. And, I mean, absolutely roast him for a long touchdown immediately. By the way, Tyreek Hill's on pace for over 2,200 receiving yards this season and like to me he actually has a chance to like keep this thing up uh he had the really long yards after the catch play and josh you'll really like this one because we have that scheme episode they do that little cheat motion that's what shanahan's calling it but instead of running full speed and like getting tyree kill's momentum going they then have him stop and run a screen off of it where he cuts back so we have (laughs) all of a sudden all the defense they're screaming backwards because tyree kill has all this momentum 
and then pause. Here comes a screen. Now you have blockers in front of them. And that's what's actually really special about this offensive line is they're good at getting out in space. They're like letting Tua get rid of the ball immediately, but out in space, it can actually get the ball moving. And this is what was so crazy with this long run for Devon Achan. Just an outside zone, very simple thing. To get beyond these two safeties here is out of control. Out hey, of when control. I was when I was watching this like just live and trying to watch the highlights. These are SEC high draft pick caliber mm -hmm. players. And then it looks like Xavier McKinney's brain just does not comprehend how fast a Chan is. Yeah. And he just doesn't because he's been playing football his entire life mm -hmm. and he's never seen anyone with these types, this type of speed to understand what angle I should take to tackle him. And yeah not even having those two safeties, like you said, contact a Chan mm -hmm. when you have a play color, you can put them out in space too. It's a ridiculous combination. Yeah. It, beyond ridiculous. That touchdown you're showing on the video, he hit 21.7 miles per hour. That was only quote unquote, only his second fastest register speed this season. He now owns three of the top six ball carrier speeds in NFL next gen stats this year. He and just breaks loose. And then number one was today on that little cheap motion screen pass uh, to Tyreek Hill. So this was just remarkable stuff. Obviously, both Raheem and uh, Devon Chan could do stuff like this. Like this easily could have been Raheem Moster, but these guys are going to absolutely be dunking on models. We all we all know that uh, for this week, just if you care about snaps, which I'm not even sure we should care about snaps no. in this offense. Raheem got 60% of the snaps. He had a goal line touchdown. Both of them fumbled. That was the interesting part. Raheem had two fumbles last week. He fumbled it this week. It went out of bounds. Devon Achan fumbled it. It was actually recovered by the Giants. But then next plays later, we had this one. So it's speed, speed, speed. It's absolutely ridiculous stuff. Now, with real quick, with just with Tua, two absolutely mind-numbing interceptions late on both of them. One was a pick six. Uh, the other one was unexcusable as well. He knew that, but they are so quickly back on the field and running for, for 50, 60 yard plays that ultimately doesn't even matter. So to me, this is an, an offense we have never seen before. It was the same thing here. They had three turnovers in this game. They still have 31 points. It was an absolute breeze out here. And this was out without, uh, without Teron Armstead as well. It's one of those offenses that when your team is playing them, a seven yard gain giving up is a, is a win. <laughs> like I believe yeah, that, that is so ridiculous to say about an NFL team. Also ridiculous to say is a rookie, you know, calling Tyree Kill, uh, hey, buddy, you're not that fast. You got hawked uh, even yeah. when you hit 22 miles per hour. The confidence that HN is playing with right now is yeah. uh, is is pretty sensational stuff. Um, I got a question okay. for you guys real quick, though. Yeah. Temperature check on Jalen Waddle. He scores a touchdown yep. here. The complete monster upside games we have not seen yet. Now, I don't want to be put pressing the panic button too much because I think all these yards after the catch stuff, Jalen Waddle can easily participate in. But at the same time, the fact that they are getting this production from the running backs is a new aspect of this game. And that could be taking away some things from Jalen Waddle at the same time, though. Waddle did have 10 targets. They just went for 35 yards. This game, a couple of those were in the red area, uh, which will bring that number down. But it's just been interesting to see everyone get home constantly. And then Jalen Waddle's just been relatively quiet to start the year. Dave, I would love your input on this because we've talked about this in Stats versus Film. So Hayden knows my take on it. So I'd love yours. Uh, coming into this game, Tyreek Hill had seen over 32% of the team's targets. This was somewhat the argument coming into mm -hmm. the year was that if the ball is spread out, and we didn't know exactly where it was going to be spread out to, but if it were spread out, Tyreek Hill, the king of earning targets and getting scheme targets, does not go away. It goes away from Jalen Waddle. Whatever we think about Jalen Waddle for his efficiency, and that's kind of what happening is Jalen Waddle in even before his injury, averaging over twenty yards per catch, was getting there based on solely explosiveness, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You can still get there in fantasy on explosiveness, as a freaking A-chan is showing you every single week, but you're going to just have to take some lumps with that efficiency, and that's what's happening right now. Yeah, they had no counterpunch last year, you know, and so that's why, what, nearly 60% of the targets were funneled into two places, yeah. yep. and so now that you have explosive plays coming from your running backs, by the way, Mike McDaniel was the run game connoisseur in San Francisco yeah. for years, then it just makes sense to not have to funnel everything through to his hands into one of these other guys. Now, 
to be honest with you, I, an interesting experiment would be what if Tyreek Hill goes down and like can Jalen Waddle do similar things? I don't think so, even though he still is one of the okay. fastest wide receivers in the league. I just don't think anyone has the Tyreek esque ability to mm. you know create those explosive the stop start style to his game. The Dolphins also, before we move on to the Giants, if we even are moving on to the Giants, <laughs> uh, have five offensive touchdowns of 50-plus yards this year, which is the most by any team per ESPN Stats and Info since, of course, the offense that the Dolphins are usually related to, and that is the greatest show on turf. Wow. Wow. Okay, talk to me about the Giants. Um, Daniel Jones leaves with a neck injury. He took six sacks in this game. Uh, He did do the post-game press conference, so I think that there's some optimism there. Darren Waller may be the bright spot. 11 targets, 8 receptions, 86 yards. Yeah, so Daniel Jones was getting absolutely crushed. They were missing three offensive linemen in the middle oh. of the game. Their backup center, he leaves uh, as well. So it was just a complete joke. After getting sacked 11 times last week, he makes it through six sacks before leaving. He said in that post-game conference that, uh, that this neck injury felt similar to his previous neck injury back in, I believe it was 2021, which doesn't sound good. Um, but we shall see until this offensive line gets back. This offense is a complete joke. Uh, some fantasy nuggets, though, like you said, Darren Waller did get there more this week than he had previously. They're using him kind of all over the formation, which is nice to see some of these routes on the actual outside were a little bit more similar to what we were getting in the preseason, but they really have to work for every single yard that they're getting. At least Tyrod Taylor is a capable backup if it's going to be him the following week. And then for the running backs, probably not going to matter because Saquon seems like he's getting pretty close to returning, but it was Matt Breida only playing 59% of the snaps this week. That's simply just not good enough in this offense, but the wide receivers continue to rotate around. Wandale had a concussion, was ruled out, then returned back to the game. Don't know. How is that possible? Don't, don't ask me. I don't make the concussion rules, Uh, but that happened. Uh, Ultimately, he's a PPR scam if you're interested in that, but to me, if you are starting Wandale Robinson in your league, you're probably not winning a, a fantasy championship anytime soon. Just to put it into more perspective, how poor this Giants offense has been, I don't blame Daniel Jones. I think it's more of the offensive line right now, but who's to say, given the tougher schedule? The fact is they haven't scored a touchdown in three or five games. They have 12 points in five first halves played so far, and they haven't scored a touchdown in their last 85 minutes of regulation. Yeah, yeah, they have a player. um, They actually have two different players on the Giants offensive line, according to PFF, with a 0.0 PFF grade. (laughs) All of them them are in the red category. Uh, It is absolutely ridiculous to see what these final numbers are going to be. But it's looking at the Giants had 30 quarterback pressures this game. 30. Uh, Wow. Again, given like what the Texans have gone through and been competitive. Like I blame coaching staffs. Now I don't ever want to now just say this is the offensive line's fault because the Texans are doing just fine. But even like Ben Bredesen was John Michael Smith's backup at start at starting center. So they're on their backup center and then their backup center got injured today. So they ended the giants ended up playing two practice squad offensive linemen who were not supposed to play in this game. They played today. Wow. It, it's okay. time to trade Saquon Barkley. Like when he gets healthy, this wow. the season's over. It's over. It is over. finally closing with the Dolphins here. Um, two of the next four games they play are against the Philadelphia Eagles and the Kansas City Chiefs. So yes. those are going to be Hot. fun, fun, fun contests for a four and one team. Texans versus Falcons. Your Atlanta Falcons improved to three and two on the season with a last second young way coup field goal beating the frisky Houston Texans 21 to 19. And gentlemen, we arrived finally to this point. This is the best Desmond Ritter performance any of you will ever see. 28 of 37, 329 yards, one touchdown, and a rushing score to go on top of it. He honestly carried this team at portions of the game, which is, again, a phrase we have never uttered when it comes next to Desmond Ritter's name. Bijan Robinson, Tyler Algier combined for 31 carries for 86 yards. Granted, Bijan also made a ludicrous shovel pass catch that he no looked, held onto his thigh while juking out a linebacker in the hole that he walked into the end zone with. But man, what we got in this receiving game, Cal Pitt, seven for 87 on 11 targets. We'll talk about that in a moment. Drake London, nine targets, six receptions, 78 yards, including a field goal, Setting up catch 32 yards that was in the triangle. 
void that the Texans just left open with about 50 seconds to go to put them in, again into the game-winning field goal range. And then, yeah, Johnny Smith pops up here for six receptions, 67 yards. We've talked about D'Amico Ryans, especially like last week against Kenny Pickett, making him look like he didn't belong in the NFL, just confusing him on every single snap. Desmond Ritter looked composed, only one turnover where they throw the entire afternoon. And hopefully this is something to build on because it was a very neutral game script for the entire time. And they basically were dead even in terms of passes of 38 and carries in 36 in this game. I mean, that's super encouraging to at least have an opportunity for Kyle Pitts to get out there. I mean, that's probably the big storyline here. Was there, did Kyle Pitts himself look any better? Like, obviously, we, we've had that gate issue, um, or was it just simply that they were allowing him to throw the ball? Yeah. I mean, big change is the answer of how can we get Kyle Pitts going is just to ask him to turn left. And like, that kind of is a joke, but it's kind of not. These weren't very sharp turns in his routes, let's say. So it allowed him to like build up speed and just almost body these Texans defensive backs. Um, but like, again, these were downfield routes. Desmond Ritter was hitting to all these pass catchers. Like this is nothing that was 10 yards or 15 yards and shorter. These were big time throws into the teeth of the defense. And sure, a couple of them sailed early on and it wasn't perfect. But what was perfect was this offensive line's ability to hold up. And so he was able to step into a bunch of these throws and Arthur Smith cooking up a passing game. I want to look mm -hmm. at the all 22 of it tomorrow and see why these voids existed in a D'Amico Ryan's defense. Cause I don't know if we've seen them really get this carved up this quickly uh, yeah. this, this year. Still quite funny that Drake London's 20 plus yard design pass was to Johnny Smith, not Kyle Pitts, but at least we <laughs> saw Kyle Pitts still get there. Uh, it, it was a sick left-handed. I didn't know Drake London was left-handed, but now the rest oh. of the NFL knows. Um, okay, quickly on the other end, CJ Stroud goes 20 of 35, 249 yards of score there. Uh, Damien Pierce racks up 21 touches for 82 yards. The big issue with the Houston Texans is that they just did not have touchdown scoring plays. They did not have four-point plays. Uh, field goal in the first half, field goal in the first half, three field goals in the first half, I should say. They kicked a total of four in the entire game and only scored a touchdown, which they thought was going to win it, which was a beautifully lofted pass to Dalton Schultz that I'll call like an over up because he kept running these same middle of the field routes over and over and over again. I'm sure this was like a sideline call that Bobby Sloak and company made because we know Jesse Bates bites on those, almost picked off C.J. Stroud earlier in the game on one. We know he picked off Bryce Young twice, another rookie this season. And so Dalton Schultz sucks him in and then hits it up the field. And again, it was a beautifully lofted pass on those, but it just wasn't enough. Again, you really can't kick five field goals, no matter if you're playing you know, the Miami Dolphins or the Houston Texans uh, and not have a chance to lose the game in the end. And it wasn't just Tank Dale leaving for that concussion. Robert Woods yeah. also left for a couple series, which is why I think when people look at the box score and see Dalton Schultz leading the team in targets, that's what happens when your two of your top receivers get injured. So we'll see what happens next week with them as well. And there were a number of injuries in this game. Tank Dell yeah. had his concussion on an awesome third down catch that like he worked back towards the football. Sacrificed dove, himself. Yeah, barely scooped it up and like hit and crunched his head at the exact same time. Uh, AJ Terrell left for a period in this game yep. too. Um, but hopefully all those work out because obviously those are two very, very key pieces uh, to those offenses. Chiefs versus Vikings. Daigle, talk to me. You had uh, the best games of the day. And in the end, we had two significant injuries to the two critical pieces in this game with Travis Kelsey and Justin Jefferson either not finishing the game or limping towards it. But in the end, the Chiefs improve to 4-1 and one with a 27-20 to 20 victory on the road over the Minnesota Vikings. What's funny is that you set this up as an exciting game, and I don't necessarily blame you, but it didn't feel exciting when you were watching it. They lacked <laughs> so much explosion throughout. Uh, Travis Kelsey entered in the second half, but did end up coming back, and sure, he looked like he was limping a little bit in the end. We'll see. See if it happens to linger, because as we know, players can usually go to the back, get some help, come back out, play play the second half, and finish this thing out. But overall, it just really signified 
two teams that are still trying to find their identity. It is kind of hilarious that the Vikings are now 0-4. All four of their losses are in one-score games after last year's 13-0 record in that department. But genuinely, man, it just came down to the Vikings even trailing in the second half, 27-13. But you knew they weren't going away. No Vikings game is ever decided by two scores. They have to stick around as their fate for the entire time. And that's what it ultimately came down to. I think I think the fantasy usage, honestly, is more exciting to talk about than the actual game because it really just came down to the, the final seconds when Kirk Cousins, the Vikings offense, eventually turned it over because – Everyone was excited for Rasheed Rice, who, like a lot of upcoming players, their role just doesn't grow significantly overnight. We have a we as a civilization have lost patience for the process. And even Rasheed Rice today, 23% of routes. Did he score a touchdown? Yes, because he's good and should be playing more. But it doesn't matter when the team doesn't play him more. So yet again, Rasheed Rice needs to be playing more. Targeted yeah. Josh literally on 50% of his routes today. But again, he's not playing. So target per routes run is a little bit skewed there. I would hope that eventually means he gets to play more. And then beyond that, two big Justin Watson catches because Justin Watson has never caught anything under 20 yards in his entire career. <laughs> and on the other side of the ball, we saw steal a dwindling backfield for Alexander Madison. He gets there on the screen pass whenever they were down 27 to 13. Catches them up, yes. But at the same time, last week, remember, he handled a season low in his share of backfield touches and came back their first active game. Today, a season low 55% of backfield touches compared to Cam Akers at just 35%, but that's literally double than what Akers handled last week. So the trend is still heading one way. Uh, it ultimately just came down to the Vikings failing to get there in the end. I think I saw a pretty big injury with Justin Jefferson, maybe like a hamstring or muscle injury yeah. like later in the game. I see that as his snaps and routes and all that stuff was down. But obviously, that'd be like the biggest story of one of the big stories of the week. If it lingers. And more worrisome because he was on the sideline for the final drive when they were trailing by one score. He didn't come back out. He put the towel yeah. over his head. That's right. what makes me more scared than anything. I, I think the NFLPA has already surveyed all of the turfs across the league. And the, the turf that's at the Viking stadium is something called either slick turf or slit turf or something like that. Yeah. And they have come down and said that it is the most dangerous of all of them. And in this game, mm. we get Travis Kelsey and we get Justin Jefferson with two sig I I'm not gonna call them significant because we don't know yet, but it sounds like it's a high ankle for Travis Kelsey. And we don't know if it's a knee or whatever for Justin Jefferson yet. And it, I don't think that's something you can change, you know, in season, so this is something to, I think, definitely monitor because I think it's on the radars of players more than it has been at any point in this discussion before. And to that point, yes, both injuries, Kelsey and Jefferson, were non-contact. They were both cutting on their routes and happened to come down and then were just patted down on the field. So maybe so. Dale, did Jordan Addison pop up uh, in anything on tape? I saw that he had a really nice comeback route on like a third yeah. down that they really needed. And then that touchdown was, to me, looked like it was man coverage running across the back line. But obviously, if Jefferson's out this next week, the question becomes, how high do you rank Jordan Addison? You're for sure starting, though, just how high? Quite high. I, we we all have more confidence in Addison in the fantasy world than the coaching staff does. That's okay. No big deal. KG Osborne continues running more routes than him. But the fact is, he's the one who's separating, not Osborne, who to this point had only been targeted on 10.5% of his routes despite running more routes in every game besides yeah. Addison. Just hasn't mattered for this offense. Whereas, just go back and look at those two plays you mentioned. Addison's touchdown, one-on-one -on -one coverage in the back of the end zone. He's the one who separates with a cut to his left, not anyone else helping him out, not the way the defense was schemed. And then the big third down for him as well, that's all Addison separating. Um, he's had no issue doing that either, showing us in the first couple of games of the year too. Yeah. Going back to your conversation on Rasheed Rice and you know putting Jordan Addison in it too, one of my favorite phrases is progression is not linear. You know? And sure. I think we always think about it that it should be for rookies where, okay, they show this little thing. And that means they're just going to slightly improve on that each and every week. And the team knows that too. So we're just going to keep stacking these weeks and games. And it's just going to jump from a snap count of, you know, 55%, then 62% the next week, then the 70 to 79. It just doesn't work that way. Right. And so I, I think, and I'm telling myself this too, 
we need to almost contextualize these talents in the teams that they're on and, you know, go on what we are seeing thus far uh, Again, also in the context of the games and the injuries going around them. I don't know if that made sense, but basically what I'm trying mm-hmm. to say with Rasheed Rice is I feel like they've missed this, not power slot necessarily, but like bigger bodied guy who can catch and then win after the catch because that's so different than the Kadarius Tony's lateral stuff, whatever Sky Moore is out there to do, whatever MVS is out there to do, right? And while Juju has significantly lost a couple of steps, he was clear that option for them last year. Not saying Juju was perfect last year, but Rasheed Rice has flaws to his game. Rough edges. He's going to make some drops. He's probably going to fumble a couple passes, so on and so forth. But again, Dago, I think we can also look at while his snap share isn't jumping every single week, potentially, and it's not, again, linear, we also know that there's no one else on this wide receiver room or roster that can do what he's doing. So to me, I can do in a roundabout way, get to the end point that he is going to end up playing more when it matters most for us. I completely agree with that. And it's not like they took any wrong steps in this direction so far. The Chiefs goal, I was watching the game with friends, hence my video right now. I'm still at a friend's house recording this. And I tried explaining, like, listen, the Chiefs goal is to fit Patrick Mahomes and Chris Jones in their salary cap every year because they are the two most important players on that team. And Patrick Mahomes naturally elevates whomever else they put on that team. That's why you can kind of waste those slots. Again, they haven't got it wrong so far. Even McCall Harden was healthy scratch for the Jets today because the Chiefs knew the type of player he was. There was no reason ever to bring him back. They're taking little pop shots on day two and three, hoping to get it right. And so far, again, based on what Rice has done to this point, They've gotten it right. It's just going to be a slow progression. And although that frustrates us in fantasy, like you said, Josh, that's okay. Yeah. And Hayden, I can say the exact same thing for Jordan Addison, because you and I sit there every single Friday and say, well, what if, what if this is the week that he's out there in two wide receiver sets and every single time? Again, I think eventually he will get there once they feel comfortable with him doing that, because it's exactly what Daigle outlined. KJ Osborne cannot offer what Jordan Addison does. And we saw it in this game that when Justin Jefferson gives the second wide receiver advantageous looks, we know that Jordan Addison has the ability to maximize on those much more than KJ Osborne does. And it's exactly yep. what Kevin O'Connell said after their draft press conference. It makes it the, the, the player that stand out the most when we talk about it's a long season typically can be yeah. the rookies. Yeah. Definitely. And Isaiah Pacheco for the chiefs is still lasting. Uh, 74% of the team's backfield touches now over the last two weeks. No one else matters in this backfield. Jarrett McKinnon averaging three touches per game this year. Move on. It is only Pacheco's backfield. The four and one jet, or excuse me, the four and one chiefs coming up have the Denver Broncos and the chargers and the Broncos again. Yeah. Thursday night game. They play them two times in their next three games. And that's for the Vikings. They also have a cupcake defense with Chicago bears coming up. Well, if it's a short short week for Travis Kelsey and it is right. an ankle sprain and it's against the Broncos, I wouldn't be surprised if he missed. So I, I, I'm sure when Daigle's writing his waiver wire column, Rasheed Rice, if Kelsey's not out there, will be probably my top 36. And I will be citing week one's target shares because remember, we've already seen one game without Travis mm-hmm. Kelsey. Ravens versus Steelers. Hayden. The box score is not kind to Lamar Jackson. No. 22 of 38, 236 yards, and an interception, also taking four sacks to go along with 45 rushing yards. Does that give the context to a game where the Ravens lose to the Pittsburgh Steelers 17 to just 10 points? They had seven drops. That was oh. like the thing that like stuck out, and they were some of the most egregious touchdown yep. altering drops you can make. It started with Mark Andrews. Rashad Bateman had one that was completely unexcusable. Rashad Bateman also had a ball thrown on the sideline over his shoulder that he almost didn't even get his hands on entirely. Rashad Bateman's playing behind Nelson Aguilar in certain situations. We had Odell Beckham leave the game. Uh, Zay had a very inconsistent game, in my opinion. So, of course, Lamar Jackson, he made a couple mistakes late in the game. Got that strip sack, for example. But... It was one of these where, and I tweeted out, the the Ravens wide receiver group is the most overrated unit 
to me in fantasy. Like we can pretend that Zay is a perfect player. He's not today. He worked more at downfield, but he definitely had some mistakes. In fact, on Zay, uh, they had to call a timeout at the goal line because he didn't know what the play was. And they almost took a delay game because of that. Odell Beckham hasn't done anything. Not a surprise there. Rashad Bateman, they can't even get him into the starting lineup at this point. So we're basically back to like, is Nelson Aguilar one of their best options? And if that is the case, which I actually do believe is the case, Lamar Jackson, we're back at square one. Despite the investments, they're putting an effort to the position. They are not showing up in the box score. It's Mark Andrews when he's going and then Lamar Jackson as a rusher, but this was a very sloppy game. And it was so crazy about this is even though the Ravens had 10 points for the entire game, mostly it felt like the Steelers had no chance of winning this game right. because that's how bad their own offense was. Yeah. You know, I, I wasn't able to watch this game live, just only caught some highlights along the way, but yes, the Ravens scored all of their points in the first half, but shouldn't that have easily been like 21 to nothing instead yes. of like 10 to nothing. And then what that does when you're, Pass catchers let you down. Either it's back to back drops from Mark Andrews and Zay Flowers, and there's one to Nelson Aguilar. What that does in the early parts of the game then opens up the opportunities for the quarterback who was playing well towards the end of the game to yeah. then let you down. Like you said, mm -hmm. with the sack fumble, with the poorly thrown pass to Odell Beckham that he was trying to do a fade into the corner of the end zone. And so while both ended up making the mistakes, and in the end, it was the quarterback, the early ones could have prevented the later ones. And yeah. it's it's just, I hate that we're here. And hey, we always talk about it heading into the weeks that, man, we think the Ravens are good. And then Vegas projects them for like 21 and a quarter points, even though yeah. they're favorites. And that is always telling to me because it's Lamar Jackson's show and no one else is lifting anything up besides that. Yep. That was literally my takeaway watching this game was, oh, the Steelers defense still cannot stop anyone, but you just don't see into the box score considering like Hayden said, out of those seven drops, quite literally four were touchdowns. Walk-in mm -hmm. touchdowns for the Ravens, and it was everyone's fault. From Aguilar, 50-yarder dropped, to Andrews and Rashad Bateman on back-to-back -back goal line plays dropped. Beckham, of course, doesn't catch his – doesn't play a snap till the team's third drive, and then on his first catch, actually has to exit the game with another injury. Rashad Bateman seen limping on the sideline. He leaves the game after this one. He refuses to talk to media afterwards. Like, he's just not out even of the game. He's not even present on this team, honestly. It flows through two, three players. It is yep. Lamar, Andrews, and to a lesser extent, Zay Flowers right now. It's just a lot of trying to figure it out because they're right there. They're they're on the cusp, but there's still so much miscommunication and egregious decisions and accidents that happen. So now on the other side of the ball, Steelers pull off this win at the very last second. And Kenny Pickett, I thought, was average at best it was a super slow start on the offense no surprise there of course uh we have a lot of respect for the ravens defense they got marlon humphrey back their number one corner but george pickens actually seals this game against marlon humphrey there he was in complete isolation in my opinion marlon humphrey didn't look like he had the same speed no surprise there coming off of a foot injury but george pickham just beats him down the sideline in this game it was vintage george pickens and if you want to critique his flaws, we can certainly do that. Uh, like you're showing here with next gen stats, only one in breaking route. He's been very inconsistent in that part of the field, but at the same time, he makes some of the most outrageous sideline catches you will ever see. We had another complete uh, mossing, getting his toes in on this one as well. He ultimately finishes with six receptions, 130 yards and a touchdown. The only dream of an explosive play that Pittsburgh can dream up is with George Pickens winning uh, after the catch or deep downfield. The ground game was a joke as usual. Najee ran away from Jalen Warren when it comes to touches, but Jalen Warren certainly was mixing in a little bit more uh, this week. There's offensive just game plan explosiveness is a joke, but at least we know George Pickens has the upside case uh, if he can just come down with these kind of 50-50 balls near the sideline. All right, let's continue with the uh... – Highly acclaimed Nate Hackett Bowl. Jets versus Broncos. Once again, my game sucked. But here, the Jets <laughs> improved to two and three on the season, being the Denver Broncos 31 to 21. There were a comedy of errors in this game. I, I, I cannot stress that enough. A Marvin Mims muff punt to open. Then the Jets muff their own punt later on in the second half. Marvin Mims then fumbles another play. That's a high pitchback on a re double reverse that he gets from Samaj P. Ryan. Then 
Zach Wilson to potentially ice the game throws an interception to Patrick Sertan in one-on-one -on -one coverage with Garrett Wilson, who had back shoulder leverage. Let's put it that way. The pass needs to go high and away. And instead it goes low and in the inside and Patrick Sertan basically intercepts it with his ankles. And then it ends with a Russell Wilson fumble six, two plays later. Um, the only plays that really mattered here, if we're talking about positives, are one, Brees Hall. 22 carries, 177 yards, and one score, including a 72-yard run for a touchdown. Brees Hall, early in this game, was making plenty of Broncos defenders miss at the first and the second level. And that third level safety was always the one to bring him down. And so we were seeing these 10, 12, 20-yard runs to open this game. And I knew that if he could make that final guy miss, he would be off the races, an explosive gain. And he finally did it. He got up to, what, 21 and a half miles per hour on this run, which basically matches exactly what he put out in the field last year. It's exactly what the usage we want to see from Brees Hall, albeit against a very easy Broncos defense. But they made them look foolish. And then quickly on the Broncos end, we knew that Javante Williams was going to be out of this game during the one o'clock window. And so Jaleel McLaughlin pops in. And I mean, man, he's like 80% Devon Achan. Dude, just the way he, fast, the way he's he so can good rocket in his first two steps and explode out of it. I don't know how you can put this little bit of specialness that the Broncos have back in the bottle because in totality heading into six minutes left in the fourth quarter, the Broncos wide receivers combined for about 11 yards. Yep. So nothing else is working right now other than 73 yards to Samaje P Ryan in the air you know, 26 yards to Adam Troutman plus a touchdown, and then Jaleel McLaughlin when he pops into, and Sean Payton has a rough rest of the season on tap. What I've noticed, and I think that you got to give a lot of credit to Mike McDaniel, is there's now a path for these tiny running backs like Jaleel to get onto the field and to be schemed up. I know that his big play here was a little screen play. And I'm not saying Mike McDaniel invented the running back screen or anything like that, but there's been some stealing of concepts that are allowing players like Jaleel to be very efficient on their 10 to 12 touches. And Javante Williams before his, his injury to me was not standing out on tape whatsoever. And this is a new staff when you're talking about Javante Williams. And it was very clear when Daigle was talking about that, that one random touchdown that we had a couple weeks ago with Jaleel it has always been in the back of my head. So I don't think this is as simple as Javante returns and we never hear from Jaleel again. This to me could be easily a three back committee and maybe Jaleel's the guy that has the most juice. I think that's a fact actually. Jaleel has five, 10 plus yard carries on 24 carries to date yeah. for reference. Tony Pollard has five, 10 plus yard carries on 76 carries to date. Mm -hmm. Like dude, Jaleel, I don't know how he does it. I don't know where Sean Payton found him. He's like you said, Josh, he's a little Austin Eckler. He's a little Brees Hall. He's kind well, of just everyone. And Look, we know that they had, and it, it wasn't this regime, but a second round pick invested into Javante Williams coming off significant injury. We know that they brought in Samaj P. Ryan to play a role, but let's be honest. Like Sean Payton has always had a style of running back that is up Jaleel McLaughlin's alley. You can go to Reggie Bush. You can go to Pierre Thomas. I'm sure I'm forgetting Alvin Kamara. Darren you know, Sproles. Darren Sproles. Like these are... Pass catchers that might not be viewed be viewed as every down backs when entering the NFL, but they have juice to them. Mm -hmm. And so I think even when Javante comes back, he has staying power. And it's also on my radar. The first half splits and the second half splits are so staggeringly different to this Broncos team. I know like the first 15 plays are not totally scripted, but once you escape that, it felt like Russell Wilson was just totally lost. And it's so clear that he and Sean Payton aren't on the same page. And again, Sean Payton spoke a lot of words this summer. They are now one and four. Their next six games on their schedule are somewhat brutal from a standpoint of being an awful team when it's the Chiefs, the Packers, the Chiefs, the Bills, the Vikings, and the Browns. There's a very big chance that this team is one and 10 when we look back here in six games. And it won't make it to that point without Sean Payton throwing someone else under the bus at that point, whether it be DC Vance Joseph or whether it be the quarterback and bring in the 12th highest paid player on the team in Jarrett Stidham over Russell Wilson. It's going to be 
agreed with that, yes, Russell Wilson played far and away his worst game under Sean Payton, at least today. It was there, bad. No, there have been some other brutal ones, Dago. I mean, I, honestly, I think, I think he's been fine to date, honestly. I mean, oh, I mean, it's only been five weeks, but That's fair. The Russell and Wilson experiment with long-term Sean Payton, it's so sure. clearly not going to work. It's I, so I agree. Going to He's going to get benched because coaches play their guys. Sean Payton, even Marvin Mims today, ran eight routes. It doesn't matter what Marvin Mims does. He's well, never he going to play. Twice. Uh, yes, but they also went out and signed <laughs> Traquan Smith heading into this game. They also have Will Lutz as their kicker. They only play Saints guys. That's okay. We know they traded Sean for Payton Adam is. Troutman. Traded. We, we know who Sean Payton is. It's okay. Um, but I, I genuinely don't think Russ is like the major problem here. I think he's been just fine. We can disagree. I think, well, no, no, no. I, look, I think it's probably a lot of problems, including trading for Wils Russell Wilson is the biggest including problem. Trading for Sean Payton. Let's start there too. Yeah. But again, Sean Payton has full control over everything and yes. he's not going to go out lightly getting embarrassed like this is my point quickly yeah. for all of our jets fans, because again, they are two and three right now and their defense wins it in the end. Um, on a fumble six. I think they only scored 22 points on offense in this game. Uh, it was via five field goals and then that one Brees Hall touchdown. So while Zach Wilson did have, you know, a few good completions and go 19 of 26 for 199 yards, um, there was this nice throwback where he rolled out right, totally clean pocket, hit this nice over route to Garrett Wilson. There's also a great play call on like a third and four that. Nathaniel Hackett used motion and it forced the Denver defensive back to work over top. And then an easy, again, third down conversion to Garrett Wilson there. So I think that they're like, again, trying to figure out what Zach Wilson can do. But there was also a stretch of about like 25 snaps where they, you know, ran the ball 20 times and passed it five times. But again, in yeah. the end, there were not enough mistakes made on the Jets end to lose this game. And on some level, this is the world that the Jets are still living in. And in, on the other level, it is the Broncos defense that Brees Hall run. I'm so pumped that he's able to run that fast. There wasn't a linebacker in sight. And that has been the case every single week. And it will not change the rest of the season. Titans versus Colts. The Indianapolis Colts win 23 to 16 over the Tennessee Titans. They are three and two now. But biggest Story coming out of this, Anthony Richardson leaves with an AC joint injury on his right shoulder. I got to say it, big athletic quarterbacks with shoulder issues uh, are probably the thing I hate the most in the NFL. Different type of shoulder injury. I know you're trying to link this to Cam Newton, but this was an AC joint sprain. It seems like he'll need an injection to play through that because it was to his throwing shoulder. He's probably not going to play next week. But Gardner Minshew is a more than capable backup quarterback. He can distribute the ball to Josh Downs and to Michael Pittman. He's this offensive line is really able to run the ball right now. We love Shane Steichen, the play caller. It's all fitting together. But I will say Anthony Richardson needs to learn to know when to let up. We've seen it with fumbles. We saw it with a concussion. We've seen it near the goal line. We've seen it with leg injuries. And now today, this was another one where he easily could have slid down not really tried to, there was nothing going on this play and he just lands on it. And that's what happens here. The other big storyline though, with this yeah. Zach Moss, I mean, my goodness, I didn't have this on my bingo card against awesome. the Tennessee Titans uh, rushes for 165 yards and two touchdowns. There was a 56 yard run where he was just basically untouched right up the middle. His actual other touchdown run was more impressive to me. He actually had to fight through that, but it was very clear that there was a very strict, snap count for Jonathan Taylor. In fact, it started only with 10 snaps. He had six carries, had a target. Nothing really stood out to me when you're talking about Jonathan Taylor's tape. It wasn't like running with a limp or anything like that. But the reports before the, the game were true. It's going to be a slow ramp up period for Jonathan Taylor. I would say probably pretty similar to what we've seen with Brees Hall, which is a pro and con for the next couple of weeks. It's going to be very hard to distinguish between Zach Moss and Jonathan Taylor. But like we saw with Brees Hall, eventually this offense is breeding some big plays. And I do think that Jonathan Taylor can get there, but got to give a lot of credit to Zach Moss. He had not, he was not looking like a, a real starting NFL player 
in Buffalo, since he's been in Indianapolis, he has more than looked apart. But I think a lot of this just goes back to this coaching staff really knows what they're doing. I don't think it gets any slower of a ramp up than giving Zach Moss 25 of 32 backfield touches in a game Jonathan Taylor is active for. And it's like you said, it's very reminiscent of Devontae Freeman breaking out in Atlanta. That's what my brain goes to as a player who just like struggled so badly. We did not think he was ever going to figure it out in the NFL. And then it just clicked one year uh, under Shane Steichen for whatever reason. Don't ask me why it's clicked for Zach Moss. Cause on the entire year, he's looked incredible, man. I mean, this is against the Tennessee why, Titans. This is against the Tennessee yeah. Titans, a, a run defense that, Every single week, we're like, oh, we got to avoid. And maybe the running back catches a pass for a touchdown or he falls in the end zone. I, maybe it's this Colts offensive line that we need to give a bit more credit to and how this is really the first time we've seen the Titans moved around a bit. And sure, I think they were without Tyre Tart. They might have been without a couple more pieces too. And those can be significant. But now with Gardner Minshew at the helm, Hayden, things do shift, right? Because this is the second time in five games where Anthony Richardson's had to leave halfway through. Plus he missed a third game on top of that already. And things do change on the offense a little bit. Like we get Josh Downs up here for six receptions, 97 yards. Michael Pittman kind of gets relegated for five of 52 on seven targets. And sure, major part of that is, you know, the running game getting 193 yards. But it on some level is also pretty amazing to me that this offense can flip between a talent like Anthony Richardson at quarterback and Gardner Minshew at quarterback. Mm -hmm. And I think still win both games that each play in. Yeah. I, I think that that just speaks to Gardner Minshew, like being able to run a sophisticated offense, Josh Downs. There's a lot of the same old stuff. Definitely going to be working more underneath, but he, he has some more playmaking juice to me than other slot only types of wide receivers. And the other thing about this offense even though he is a slot only player. And I do, do want to use that as a slight for fantasy purposes. He was out there for 27 of the 32 routes because this offense is three wide receiver base, especially when they're getting into negative game script. So Josh downs more or less a PPR scam, but I do actually believe in it a little bit because Alec Pierce is part of the underdog cardio club at this point. I do think that Michael Pittman will have some big games down the stretch, but I think the big thing for this game is just, Next week for Jonathan Taylor, like I think appropriate ranking is always just going to be in this kind of flex tier until he actually proves it. And I don't think it's just going to go from 10 snaps to 80% snaps all of a sudden, especially after this game for Zach Moss. Uh, quickly, Hayden, talk to me about the Titans and namely DeAndre Hopkins, 11 targets, eight receptions, 140 yards, because this was yep. their entire offense. Because outside of that, it was Tajay Spears who goes for 69 yards. It was a vintage DeAndre Hopkins game. There was one uh, big highlight clip where he was just working on the outside. And that big ass catch radius is just like not going to go away. Is he going to have the yards after the catch ability that he had before? Probably not. Does he look a step slower? Sure. But at the end of the day, he's still so talented when it comes to just playing wide receiver, winning at the catch point. And that transpired here without Traylon Burks. And then on that last note with, with uh, Ty J that you brought up that goes back to the Mike McDaniel uh, blueprint using a smaller player like Ty G. that was the end around De Derrick Henry's in the backfield and they throw it all the way back to Ty G who actually runs in for a touchdown it wasn't a goal line carry it wasn't anything like that um, but it was just a nice to see some of these young these younger sl uh, slider running backs actually get like a real role in the NFL it's been kind of cool to watch Taji Spears at least eight touches in four consecutive games now as a PPR value, not a scam. Yep. And DeAndre Hopkins, 32% target share today without Traylon Burks. The real story is the fact that Calvin Ridley and Christian Kirk are up next against a Colts secondary that has allowed Bad. five, six different receivers now to reach 20 PPR points. Josh, Chig got about five or six Stop check it. down options and was just, I mean, batting them away like he's playing yeah. ping pong or something. Really? It was, it was, he it he was got nine team. targets, finished with five receptions for 33 yards. So, Swatting them. again, just the idea that he needed to get more snaps. Uh, he's not even in the conversation. It's him and Jawan Johnson at the end of the line when it comes to tight ends this season. Saints versus Patriots. Uh, speaking of Jawan Johnson, he does not register on the box score today in the Saints. 34 to zero victory, John Daigle over the 
New England Patriots. I, I feel like, and this is just anecdotal, five weeks through the season, I don't know if we've ever had more zero win and one win teams throughout the league, but obviously the Patriots are one of them. But on the opposite end, Daigle, again, the Saints improved to three and two here. I was hoping you would forget about this game and make me not talk about it. But nonetheless, I will summarize it for everyone and say trailing 24 to zero in the third quarter, Bill Belichick punted on fourth and three from the Saints 40. That's what the Patriots are this year. They've been to the red zone one time, one, one single time in their last three games. Uh, oh. The Saints entered this one last in red zone scoring and yet went three for three inside the 20 in scoring because the Patriots just don't matter as an NFL team this year. Um, the Saints also, or the Patriots, I'm sorry, have yet to top 20 points five games into the season. And the offense, meanwhile, has 10 turnovers as well. So that's why they moved to one and four. The first time they've gone to that record since 2000, which, as you recall, is Belichick's first year coaching this team. And he is still like sitting on the cusp. He's just one win short of tying Don Shula and George Hallis as the only coaches in NFL history with 300 regular season victories. And it's like, man, where are you going to get there? Because this offense you've created has no juice. They've got a bunch of nothing. Mac Jones bench for the second time in consecutive games, but not not Josh, not until it was 31 nothing. That way, Belichick can show up to the podium and still have an out saying, oh, it was a blowout. So, you know, no big deal, nothing to see here. Uh, it's just a disaster of a team. We're approaching fall guy territory mm -hmm. with the Patriots now, their fifth in draft order. The question is, who is the fall guy? Because there's not one that necessarily sticks out to me unless the owner wants to get super bold and pull the trigger on bill belichick I, I think he will after the season i think it's pretty obvious you can't i don't do know if it's yeah, i don't it's know insane. if it's been announced like publicly but it's pretty evident once gerard mayo turned down all of these interviews everywhere else that he is the coach in waiting on this team probably taking what josh mcdaniel's title was going to be and i just don't see how after what we saw last season and what we're seeing this year you know, whether it be coordinator selections, especially on offense and the state of the win loss record, they're just not used to going through dry spells in New England. And so mm -hmm. to me, this is the last year that Bill Belichick, that's even if he doesn't break the record of all time wins as a head coach. I think so too. No, no Matt Judon, no Christian Gonzalez, but it generally doesn't give you an excuse to not be an NFL team. And that's what happened today. Even Mac Jones started over four with an interception, a pick six that Tyron Matthew returned. And by the way, Mac Jones uh, has six career pick sixes now. And those are tied not only with Matthew Stafford for the most since 2021, but his four career pick sixes at Gillette Stadium. That's as many as Tom Brady threw in his entire career with the Patriots. Like, it's actually incredible what Mac Jones is accomplishing right now. I, I think Mac Jones has been involved in three touchdowns over the last two weeks, and none of them to his own team because his own team has only scored three points in the last two weeks. And it's I mean, not even an excuse. Like, it doesn't do anything if I tell you that Juju and Demario Douglas got injured in this game because who cares? Like, just throw it in the line of excuses. You don't matter. Just quick usage conversation here with the saints. Cause I see some names like Kendra Miller popping up here for 12 carries for 37 yards, four catches Blowout. for 53 yards. It was, was that just all basing the second half after Alvin Kamara already has his, you know, 22 carries for 80 yards in the score. Since deeper leagues, like shuffling contingency backups, I would say the biggest news was Tony Jones getting waived on Saturday because the only running backs they had active were Alvin Kamara and Kendra Miller. Hence, the uptick in usage, 22 carries included for Camara. He then comes off the field in the blowout to give it all to Kendry Miller. But if you're looking for like one for one replacements with Tony Jones out of the way, now it is Kendry. Panthers versus Lions. Let's take a few walks down uh, multiple narrative streets here. Okay. Because last December 25th of 2022, the Carolina Panthers put 320 rushing yards on this Detroit Lions defense to go along with 250 yards in the air. So while it's a whole new coaching staff on the Panthers end, it's the same coaching staff on the Lions end. That includes Ben Johnson, who turned away final interviews with the Carolina Panthers. My belief is he would have been their head coach if he was willing to do that. 
And instead, what we get here is Ben Johnson and company putting on an absolute clinic over the Panthers with a 42 to 24 victory. An 18 point gap is giving the Panthers a lot of credit in this one because it wasn't even close. Just a couple, let's say, uh, CAPs, some cool ass plays that the uh, Detroit Lions put out there on tape today. Uh, the first one was this reverse to Khalif Raymond, who then, excuse me, handoff to David Montgomery, reverse to Khalif Raymond, toss it back to Jared Goff. We get Sam Laporta on a delayed run along the sideline. Obviously, Jeremy Chin thinks he's a blocker, and he just walks in for scores. I mean, how he was dialing it up, Ben Johnson, on this Panthers defense, it wasn't even close. And I mean, in the end, we get a 42-yard touchdown run by Dave Montgomery when he hits the hole, hits the line, gets lost in it. Panthers defenders basically like give up and he just skirts out to the edge for a long score. And yes, Josh Reynolds gets home with five targets, four receptions, 76 yards and a touchdown on his own. Man, the Sam Laporta on pace numbers are record chattering for That's rookie awesome. tight ends. It's just he's in the perfect spot. We'll see if Amon Ra uh, returns next week, I guess, for, for fantasy purposes. Anything from Jameson Williams at all, any pulse whatsoever. Uh, he early on was asked to run an in breaking route to the teeth of the defense, a linebacker waiting, and he kind of alligator arms it and drops it. Um, other than that, he caught like one screen that was given to him, but I, you probably have the snap counts in front of you before I do. Um, I don't think that they were very large in this game. It just, I mean, it wasn't necessary. This team was up 28 to 10 at halftime. So the game was totally out of hand. Um, I talked a lot about the coaching on the lines end. It's very clear their coaching staff is much better than the Panthers. And like, I could give you a hundred different reasons why, but I can just go with the first example, which is the Panthers first drive. Uh, they get to the lines 39 yard line. It's a fourth and five. And they try to get to the line and, you know, draw the lions offsides. That doesn't work. So then they take a false start penalty so they can, you know, punt it from their own 44 yard line. So again, it really, this play started at the 39. They punt it 21 yards to get it down to the 19 or 18 yard line. And then the first play is a 23 yard gain uh, that the lines pick up. So like, again, that decision-making when you're already 0 and 4, when you think it's smart and we'll just play good defense all day and we'll pin them back inside the five yard line. I mean, Mark Schleier was freaking loving it in the booth if he was up there, you know? Uh, it, it just Usually goes not to, a good sign if, it, if he's pumped up about something. The, the, the Panthers just had had no clue. Um, Bryce Young throws an interception to Aiden Hutchinson because it's a called screen pass to Ian Thomas. Ian Thomas. And yes, he gets home in the end with three touchdowns and you know has another interception on a hang defender that he doesn't see and a cornerback undercuts it and he's not making those plays at Alabama. But again, we're here through five weeks. I cannot tell you the identity of the Panthers. I cannot tell you how they connect play calls. I cannot tell you what the cohesion is. And it just sucks all the way around. I don't know how it's going to get better. They are 0-5 right now. And uh, the pass block protection is still bad. Shout out to Chandler Zavala. Hope you're okay. Because it was a gnarly injury that you know he got carted off with. But the offensive line just is not getting healthier unless like Austin Corbett somehow fixes it. And they play the Miami Dolphins next week. For the Lions, I will say David Montgomery, 100% of the team's backfield touches in the first half. Yeah. Both Zondervan Knight and Craig Reynolds were not involved. Zondervan Knight, who was banged up in the second half, only in the blowout did Craig Reynolds then get involved. So we know exactly who Montgomery is. If Jameer Gibbs, who was downgraded on Friday, happens to miss more time. Also for Josh Reynolds, everyone has bye weeks, and everyone's like parsing for replacement options. Yeah. Dude, if you take away that – egg in the box score a couple weeks ago when he was hurt whenever he suffered the groin injury and was downgraded as well he's averaging 15.7 ppr points in his surrounding oh. four starts that's good for wide receiver 16 on the year like he's just right there every week just start him it's not hard yeah and and jared golf got a rushing touchdown this game because dave yep. montgomery got stuffed at the one yard line so like there was an opportunity there too and yeah i mean hayden i do the sunday morning show daigle our guy this week was telling everyone to start josh reynolds and it, yeah. it worked out here it, it goes out. back to last year, too. When Amon Ra wasn't mm -hmm. healthy last year, Josh Reynolds had some big games. Uh, Josh, I just need you right now, next week's rankings, 
Adam Thielen is wide receiver. What? Tell it to me because I don't want to be responsible for where I'm ranking him. No, I just the volume he's getting, especially like later on in games. He's the only one that can actually get open. It's yes. crazy. These guys are sloths out there. And I guess option routes from the slot for Adam Thielen are their best bets for anything. The I don't want to go on this monologue right now, but you know, I'm seeing friends in the industry. Like I saw it today from Denny. I've seen it from other people too. Like already calling Bryce Young Zach Wilson. And to me, that is utterly ridiculous. Now, can you look at his games and say he's been bad this year and he's going to be bad? If if you want to jump to that conclusion, you can. I can also point to plenty of middle of the field plays that he is making already that to me show that he is going to be more than fine in this league. But we are through four games of his NFL career with, as everyone is putting it, a brutal coaching staff, a brutal offensive line, and guys that cannot get open, and you're comparing them to an all-time bust. To me, that is a leap that is utterly ridiculous, utterly ridiculous that I think people are going to look back on and wish they hadn't said. No matter whose fault it is, I think we can easily say this offense has nothing. And nothing. that's what I come back to for fantasy. I don't care. And I don't think he's a bust. I think he'll be fine, but I don't care. I'm just trying to get these guys out here. And right now we can only legitimately trust. And if it's even trust Adam Thielen, even Chuba Hubbard, who has arguably outplayed Miles Sanders. I know you have a bone to pick because I believe well, most of Hubbard's usage came in the second half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my main thing with the comment of we're going to get, you know, the fancy usage committee out there being like, oh, Chuba Hubbard might be the guy now in Carolina. It was all when they were down, what, 27 to 12 or whatever it was in yeah. the fourth quarter. And that's when Chuba played the entire fourth quarter. So you see okay. him out carrying Miles Sanders. Uh, you see him probably with the snap count even higher. But when this game was what they thought was a game, Deuce Staley was choosing to put Miles Sanders out there. Now, is that me saying it's a it's a case for you to go and get excited about Miles Sanders? No, I'm just telling you, I firmly would be wildly shocked if Deuce Staley in his office is going to be like, oh yeah, actually, I think Chuba Hubbard is now our starting running back. I, I, will I don't say think that's going to happen. I will say Hayden, though, you ask about Thielen uh, against the Dolphins who do allow everything in the middle of the field. Yeah, it's a great spot because the Panthers are going to have to throw 50 times. I know my final comment on Bryce is my optimistic opinion of him in the future is riding on him being a distributor because I actually think that that's where his brain works. And when there are open receivers with like alleys to throw to, it's really good. It is actually good. This team just has no one to distribute to and I think has no offensive philosophy that creates open receivers either. So what we are seeing through five games or through four games is that his playmaking to like squeeze through tight gaps between defensive linemen is not working as well. He is not as explosive trying to work around the edge too. But do I think he has despite you know the interceptions that we've talked about today, the processing to understand, hey, this is what the defense is giving me and I'm going to fire it in there in good timing. I think he has that, but that means he can't elevate probably the players that are around him, the team that's around him right now. But once he gets in a better situation, he's going to look much, much better. It's just not going to happen this year. It's not going to happen this year. I don't think it's going to happen next year. They don't have a first round pick. I don't, I don't trust, you don't, it's hard to find wide receivers. Um, and, I agree with all everything you said. To me, that is scary for a first overall pick that you traded up for. That's that's I think where a lot of people are saying, like, hey, like Andy Richardson was there, CJ Stroud was there. You traded up. This was your guy. I think I think there's a difference in saying that, which yeah. totally I was on the case, and you know this multiple times said I think all three of these guys are worthy of the number one overall pick. I think there's a different conversation in saying that, Hayden, versus oh, he's a bust, he sucks now. Yeah, no, for sure. It's just it just you're threading that needle to say he's going to be a distributor. He needs good surrounding around him. And then you're also trading all your assets to get well, somebody of that caliber. That's I'm not even saying, I, I'm not necessarily saying he has to have great talent around him. He just has to have like NFL caliber stuff. Sure. Around him. Sure. I think he's like, I think you're hopeful that he would be like a miniature version of like Joe Burrow. Yeah. But that's going to take a lot of work, a lot of work in my opinion. And, and yeah. yeah, we'll see.
it, it, it's way too early. I agree with you. Your your stance, it, it's way too early. Give them some time here. I'm just saying, I don't know when this is going to get better because totally. they don't have the assets to actually And the worst better. part of this is this conversation is going to last all season long because it's not going to get better. But we will not, we will not continue to argue in the comments on Twitter about Chuba Hubbard versus Miles Sanders, Josh. True. We have to do better. We do not have it. <laughs> Jaguars versus Bills. Sunday morning football. The Jaguars in London beat the Buffalo Bills 25 to 20. Uh, maybe I'll just start off with this comment. I don't know if you guys saw the Roger Goodell interview that he had with Neil Reynolds over on Sky Sports. It was like one of these like town forum type things. He mentioned that the Bills were guinea pigs in this situation because this is the first time ever that a team has played back-to-back -back games over in London. And he said, basically, we are using the Bills as an experiment as a team, if they can be competitive, to jump over and face off against a team that has lived there for two weeks at this point. And I think it's also fair to say, trying to connect the dots here, other than their red zone success, let's say between the 20s in this game, this was by far and away the worst Bills performance that we have seen this season other than week one against the Jets. It is hilarious to me that and it's also the most Roger Goodell thing to take a sample size of one to try to draw a conclusion in a football game, but carry on. It's very baseball playoffs where you go 160 plus games and then you give the team two games to beat the <laughs> our opponent. What are it's we like, oh, here? so all these stats, all these stats you stacked up for six months don't matter because two games just randomizes it anyhow. Can but I play this clip just so absolutely. just so we get it out there? Yeah. The Jaguars are playing consecutive games over here and staying over here. And part of that is just uh, to see how would teams react to that? How would, you know, is it, a, is it a competitive disadvantage or advantage one way or the other? Um, we'll learn something from that that will help us determine can we play more games? Could a team actually play over here? So if somebody came over here to play against the London franchise, and let's say there was more than one team over here, they would probably stay for a few weeks. So this will help us understand all right, my ears just pricked up. I mean, that <laughs> that like is putting a guinea pig label on a Buffalo Bills, one of the best teams in the league. And this isn't anything to take away from the Jaguars. They can only play in the position that they're in. They played extremely well here. Trevor made some unbelievable throws, especially that what third round dot to Calvin Ridley down the yep. field when they really needed it. And, you know, they saw a zero blitz look. That's amazing. I'm just putting myself in, you know, Bills Mafia. That's unfair. Well, the thing I didn't like about that clip is multiple teams going over there. If we can't expand the NFL, we are looking for 30 quarterbacks as is. We can't make this 34. <laughs> we are canceling teams already. We've put a couple teams six feet under, and it's October 8th. We, we There's no room for more teams if that's what Goodell is trying to pull a fast one on us. At, at one point today in the afternoon, Tyra Taylor, Bailey Zappi, we're all playing at one time. Uh, Jameis Bryce Winston Young. as well. Bryce Young, Jameis Winston. Finally, Josh. Non starters in the NFL. You're right, Josh. Uh, and I just asked, like, what are we doing here? And this is what we're doing. Like, like with politics and how you follow the money, just for NFL scheduling, like when the Bills knock off arguably the best team in the AFC and the Dolphins, uh, blow them out. And their reward is to host a home game in London against a team that just stayed there in back-to-back -back games and is now 2-0 and in London this year. That's your reward, Buffalo. Congratulations, fans. That's what the NFL cares about you. But I will say this really just came down to, as well as the Jaguars played, Buffalo, like they did with the Dolphins, hung around because of forced turnovers. Even Trevor Lawrence, two strip sacks, lost fumbles today. And that's why... Buffalo really hung around here. I think I think for fantasy, what I look at is the fact that Calvin Ridley had two catches whenever Zay Jones was back in the lineup. He wasn't earning targets yet again, which was our concern ever since week one. And then Josh is giving me that in face. Ass. That's ridiculous. That's uh, ridiculous. I mean, that's been the story the last three games. Uh, okay. I think we can dive into it like a little bit deeper than, oh, just the last three games this has happened. Last week, it was because A.J. Terrell shadowed him at the highest rate in the league across any game so far this season at 79%, right? There was also the game prior to that, we had drops and just missed touchdowns. And then in this game, 
we went eight targets, seven receptions for 122 yards. I just think people are being so freaking greedy about Calvin Ridley right now without understanding that this is like a three game span and an entire mm -hmm. 17 game season that this to me is just the maybe worst outcome we're going to get, especially, you know, last week, basically goose egging. And then we get this week. This is what happens with a good player. Like good players go through this all the time, unless you're Tyreek Hill. If you want to phrase it that way, I guess since <laughs> it's it's not 2016, so I don't care about cornerback shadow matchups, like beat your guy. Who it's cares? a big deal. It's a yeah, big I deal. Guess AJ Terrell is a big deal. I guess he is. Sure. Like, I know he's good, but come on. But we're not. I'm, we don't no, I, I'm, I'm not calling out any corner and wide receiver matchup because I think we have all come to figure out that it really doesn't happen that often. But yeah. it clearly was last week on 79% of snaps. I was just already defensive about this last week because, again, in week two and week three, there were three missed touchdowns by inches for Calvin Ridley. Again, this is just so far narrowly missed opportunities, which is the story of the entire Jaguar season. And a microcosm of that has been Calvin Ridley's performance in this small sample of time. Maybe you are right. But my seat in this is that Calvin Ridley for the entire season is going to be more than fine in your starting lineup in fantasy football. Sure. Maybe I'm phrasing it incorrectly. Maybe I should be phrasing it as Christian Kirk is earning targets at a greater rate than we thought since he's still tied with Evan Ingram for the team lead in targets in this game after dominating Calvin Ridley in targets the last three weeks. Maybe I should be phrasing it as such. Because both are valuable. And now they both get the Colts this week and will both destroy an Indianapolis secondary. That's the entire point. Zay Jones, actually the point, injured yet again in this game. Not to mention Travis Etienne with a second touchdown from outside the red zone since he doesn't carry inside the five-yard line. Who cares whenever he's getting 20-plus touches a game because they don't trust literally anyone else mm -hmm. in any other part of the field until they get inside the goal line and then they take him off the field. Yeah, my notes in this game, Josh Allen, he's had 23.6, 21.3, 36.5, and then 27.8 fantasy points. That is what round three quarterbacks can do for you. Um, obviously, other quarterbacks can match him, but his level of consistency for fantasy has been rock solid. And then also, quick shout out for Gabe Davis. I bring it up all the time, but since Gabe Davis has not been on the injury report last year with that ankle sprain, he is averaging a lot of fantasy points. It's not the, the fantasy user model is not going to like him. Get over it. He's making big plays every single week, and that's just because Josh Allen has been moving the ball. This was his first game with a 20% target share this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you already mentioned him, but Travis Etienne going 26 carries for 136 yards and two scores. I think we have shifted back Daigle to him getting inside the five-yard line carries because there have been previous weeks that he didn't, and I feel like in this game he did, and that's a pretty seismic shift in his fantasy outcomes because, yes, he can reel off a 35-yard touchdown. We've seen that in his past, yep. but there have been – we haven't seen that many moments this year inside the five-yard line for the Jaguars, but it had been Tank Bigsby. And I think, again, that shifted back to Travis Etienne. We'll cover that in Sass versus Film, but I, I, I'm just, again, when I was able to catch it, I think I saw him in there. He's getting such great usage, too, that everyone should feel happy with where he's at, earning targets as well, as opposed to mm -hmm. what he could not do last year. On the other side of the ball, I will say it's, it's big that, dude, this Bill's backfield, like, the healthier Damian Harris gets... And maybe there's something else going on here if y'all can pinpoint it. But the fact is, like, it truly is a 50-25-25 backfield. Like, James Cook is still just splitting everything. And he's been in there the past two weeks for a carry inside the five-yard line. But as we talked about last week, it was because Latavius Murray was gassed. And prior to that, it was only because it was his first carry of his entire career in that range. Uh, even in this game, now in his last in three of his last four, he's been at less than 60% of the backfield touches. Uh, this week, they don't even use the backfield whatsoever as they pretty much have to catch up and keep Josh Allen going. So just some odd usage going on with James Cook. Yeah, it's one of these rare games where the Bills are trailing and then throw out the, the balance attack. They'll go completely past the ball every single snap, and that's right. how you get rid of these guys. And also, when they're trailing, Josh Allen's making big plays down the field or scrambling himself. You don't mm -hmm. need the schemed up James Cook stuff. So I think part of it was just game script too. And we, we've talked about it that prior to this game, they were what top five in running back usage. And that has never been the case previously for the bills. They were always bottom five. That'll now shift after yeah. this game. But I do think they rely more on their backfield this year, Daigle than they have in the past. So like even the 50% James Cook, which isn't goal line except for last week, mm -hmm. um, I think is more, more valuable to us than other backs have been a la Devin Singletary. Uh, 
in the past. Okay, two more games. We'll do them quickly. Bengals versus Cardinals. I mean, I totally should have drafted and watched this game this week because uh, Joe Burrow returns back to closer to health status, I should say, with 36 of 46, 317 yards, three touchdowns, um, including a, I think, 63-yard touchdown throw to Jamar Chase, which actually traveled 58 air yards, his longest throw in the air of his NFL career. Um, that is extremely telling to me mm -hmm. because as we saw against the Tennessee Titans last week, everything was quick and within 10 yards. I'm not here to say that Joe Burrow looked extremely comfortable running and moving around, but he did look better and also following through with his motion and creating generating power off of that. That was all back. So this makes me feel so good on top of Jamar Chase getting 19 targets, 15 receptions, 192 yards and three scores. Yeah, I, I'm going to be buying in on the Bengals returning to form quicker than I think other people. We saw it with the Vegas implied team totals up at 24 points. People were not giving that enough credit. Joe Burrow himself said things are getting better. And then today that step into the throw actually getting everything down that way. I think that the Bengals are going to return to more of our uh, pre um, season expectations as long as Joe Burrow is being honest with us and, and, and getting full participants in the practice report. And it just shows you Jamar Chase can be two, uh, 2 2.98 in one week, but you can't take the big play out of a guy like that. All it takes is one coverage bus and the Cardinals right now, while they play hard, they just lack so much talent everywhere. I think that was ultimately the big difference maker. You said, Josh, you don't think he's back. Uh, I would argue he is back. When you watch this game, I mean, he looked more mobile than ever. Don't right. even look at like the spryness in the pocket, um, throwing the ball genuinely go to the first quarter. They, the Bengals reach the red zone on one of their first two possessions and Burrow takes a third down sack, but watch him escape all the pass rushers, just drowning him until he gets sacked. Uh, he also had a big scramble in the second half. Like I actually think he looks quite healthy, which is shocking compared to what he looked like when he got benched against the Titans. Love that. Love that. Uh, on the opposite end with the Cardinals, Joshua Dobbs is playing at like a really high level. And then he just starts turning the football yeah, over. I think he had a pick six. Um, but I mean, the Cardinals are just like a fun walk. They're, they're these teams that are like in the middle, right? The Cardinals are one. I'll yeah. throw in the Falcons as one. The Texans are absolutely one that look, they might be one and four. They might finish the season nine and eight. They might be two and three at this point, but they are competitive each week. They run to the football. They have some cool offensive stuff every single week, too. And while they're imperfect, the Cardinals are one of those teams that are really enjoyable watches this season. It reminds me of the Lions like a couple years ago, like not last year's Lions, like the, the year before that, where they were clearly just lacking uh, talent, but they had some, um, at least some one, of, one of these teams is going to be like last year's Lions, where they start the season miserably and then finish the season Texas. extremely strong. And I th actually think the, I think the Lions have won 15. Oh, excuse me. They're 12 and three in their last 15 games. So this like carries on to the next year too. Like mm -hmm. again, one of these teams is going to finish the year really strong and it's going to carry into 2024 in a big way. I think some of the biggest news out of this one was that James Connor was injured and did not return. Uh, the, the Cardinals play the Rams next week. Keontae Ingram still battling a neck injury. So as it stands right now, Emari DiMercato, who backed up Kendry Miller before the college football playoffs whenever Miller was injured initially at TCU. Uh, that's their lone running back as it stands. Is, do we know if he's one of TCU has like a bunch of absolute freak athletes? Was he one of those types? I'll have to look into it. I don't, I don't literally look know. into your model. I can't answer that question. Just I know yet. nothing about him one day at uh -huh. a time. All right. And with Joe Mixon, I mean, it should be a awesome spot where he gets 29 touches yet. He ends with 94 yards. I mean, this is just the story of his season. Josh, wait till I pull up the end zone angle for stats versus film on these Joe Mixon goal line carries where they got yeah. stuffed. Yeah. I could not be you just not make a person miss. Dude, it was a hundred and seventy-five pounders just stonewalling him. I I I was screaming at my TV that he was not able to find the box. I don't know what was going on with that, but of course TCU coming through. I don't I don't think relative athletic score is like a perfect model like other people do, but this is very solid athletic testing from Amari mm -hmm. DiMarcato. Four so. four four speed at two thirteen. It's that'll get good. the job done. Pretty good. Yeah, and a four one five shuttle. All right, one more game. Let's get it out of here. 
Bears versus Commanders. This was Thursday night football. And what do we get for a follow-up of Justin Fields against the Denver Broncos? Is a Justin Fields 15 of 29 for 282 yards and four touchdowns. We've talked a lot about coaching today. Maybe the biggest, maybe the biggest fail of every single coaching staff in week five was Jack Del Rio just allowing these outside the numbers and vertical routes to DJ Moore over and over and over again to be hit and not adjusting. And that allows DJ, that's my DJ, to go eight receptions, 230 yards, and three scores. You say week five. I say week four because Ron Rivera allowed 166-pound Emmanuel Forbes to shadow A.J. Brown and get scorched in week four. And guess what happens? He allows 166-pound Emmanuel Forbes, first-round pick, to shadow D.J. Moore. And that, of course, leads to Forbes getting benched in the second half because Forbes can't shadow better players in the NFL right now. So that, yeah. I think that just goes down to egregious coaching like this entire year so far. Yeah, we're we're approaching fall guy territory. I think it's probably will be Del Rio unless um Rivera is so loyal to him that they won't let that happen. But some something's got to give here with the commanders. That DJ Moore touchdown in the back corner of the end zone, though, that was a special route. That was yeah. a special high point play, and that was a special pass from Justin Fields. So I think maybe we look back and part of the the longest season ever that Daigle likes to throw out there. Maybe part of that could be with Justin Fields. Uh, I don't fully trust it, but the upside nonetheless is going to be there just because DJ Moore's yards after the catch ability is awesome. And the last time I saw that with this game, they used empty, I would guess probably at the season high rate, which I do like, cause there's like four verts all the time for the bears. And to me, it's a little bit easier for Justin Fields to kind of diagnose which side of the field he wants to go to pre-snap and just throw the ball downfield. So if that is a wrinkle that Justin Fields can build upon, that's what we saw at Ohio state all the time. These si huge sideline throws that's at least getting closer to how, uh, yeah. us from our couches, how we would be deploying someone like Justin Fields. I question it against the Broncos because they're the Broncos and Fields still didn't attack on the rushing, just four carries to go along with his career high and passing points. But this past game, we were back up to double digit design runs for him to go along with the passing production. And then you say, okay, does that continue? I don't know, but I know he gets the Vikings, the Raiders, and the Chargers in his next three Ooh. games, so maybe you're asking all the wrong questions. Well, my final question with this. Through five weeks with Justin Fields, his quarterback finishes. Quarterback 15, quarterback 20, quarterback 24. In the last two weeks, quarterback three overall, and probably the quarterback one we'll see at the end of this. So what's real? Like, what is real here? Because this is very similar to what we saw last season, where – Seven games was like the quarterback 16 or 19. And yeah. then eight games, it was, hey, he's going to win your week. And it's so it's so tough to know. Do you just have to ride that wave? Or is there going to be some level of consistency there? Well, I think Deagle's the point with the, the quarterback design runs. Are, if those are up, that's, I mean, you're averaging six, seven, eight yeah. yards and sometimes 60 yards on those type of runs. So that's going to help you out. And I do think that DJ Moore is going to make a big difference. But maybe Justin Fields is a better and best ball type of quarterback. Um, but I think it goes to show like what he's like the quarterback 15 or whatever early on. Those are some of the worst quarterback actual film. And the fact that he was still, oh, he was 15, be, 20 and 24. So 15 was right. the highest of that. Group. But we were talking about some of the worst quarterback play and some of the worst right. scheming. And he was still at least getting to that level. So if we're getting actual dialogue between everybody, that's at least, um, something to monitor. Yeah. A better and best ball quarterback. I think it might be the, the right way of looking at it. Yeah. And to properly end this show. I think we'll be picking up Deontay Foreman since both Roshan and Khalil Herbert were injured on Thursday night. What can yeah, go Roshan missed with a concussion. I wonder if concussion. he'll be back. But yeah, Khalil Herbert goes down with like what looks like high ankle rough, sprain. high ankle and like tries to come back into the ball game. Um, and he was looking great the last two games too. That is uh, that is rough. I really don't want to say anything about the Commanders to be honest with you because we get another five sacks from Sam Howell. Like he. He runs, he has a magnet to defensive linemen. Like yes. when he's when he's climbing the pocket, it's as if he thinks everyone else is frozen and he's just like allowed to move. And instead he's just running into these gaps. Why does he always run up the middle? 
I'm, I'm Why sure does he that... choose the middle? Why does he never go outside the tackles? We'll end it there. Uh, Daigle, you can find his work over at 44.com. He's got a huge waiver wire column up on Mondays and Tuesdays. Um, one of the best in the business. So go and check it out. Uh, their, their videos and their uh, thread will be linked at the end of this video. So be sure to click on it. And uh, hey, now we'll be back cramming all these games and performances and we'll be back here for stats versus film on wednesday all right thanks producer weaves thanks to all of you up the villa we'll talk to y'all soon see ya <laughs>